This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk about the eighth episode in season one of the Bad Batch reunion are two returning guests to Coffee with Kenobi. First, we're going to bring in CWK newsman. Is that still a thing, by the way? Tom Gross. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Oh, man. I, you know, there's lots of news that we could be talking about. We, we, I, we need to make that happen again, Dan. Most indeed. Let's do it. Just send over your resume and I will have someone get back to you. I'll reprocess that. Good deal. Good deal. But it, <laughs> make sure it's scented, like always. I like that lavender. It's good stuff. All right. Oh. Also joining us on the show today <laughs> from Podcast Stardust, Jay Krebs. Oh, my gosh. Hey, guys. Hey, Tom. Yay. Hey, Dan. It's so good to be back having a cup of coffee with two of my favorite people and talking Bad Batch. This is so exciting. So thank yeah. you for having me. Of course. We're very excited to have you on. Excited to talk about this very important episode to the overall arc of what's going on in season one. And Jay, we'll start with you. Go ahead and give us a letter grade for the episode and just overall thoughts on what you thought of it. Overall thoughts well, on what I you thought of it. That's a little redundant. Yes. No, it, not at all. Well, I have to give this one an A. And for a lot of different reasons. Number one, because, of course, we had such a wonderful surprise at the end of a returning character that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. But there was a lot of cinematic things about this that I absolutely loved. I thought that there was a lot of edge of your seat kinds of things that I, I wasn't expecting. You know, it wasn't your typical tropes here and there and everywhere. And there was really a lot of cliffhangery stuff going on. And there's still a lot of questions that are going to need to be answered. And I just, I love that. This is, this is kind of like the, almost like the mid season finale. I've been hearing some people say, and realistically it is because we're in episode eight. I mean, we are exactly halfway through the season which is crazy to think about, but yes, definitely an A for me. I loved it. Excellent. And Tom, what about you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. A plus <laughs> indeed. <laughs> In fact, I go back to the Christmas story where Ralphie gets is, has that dream sequence and his teacher gives him an A plus, 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 <laughs> plus, plus. <laughs> that, that would be in this category for me at this point of the season because, you know, be careful what you ask for. You know, my big thing has been I want the Bad Batch to have purpose. I want the Bad Patch to have purpose. Well, my gosh, I didn't really think this was the purpose that I was uh, asking for um, that this one left us with. But I wanted a clean purpose, and I did not think anything could overshadow the return of Crosshair, but they did it. I thought this episode had great action. Um, there was wonderful moments of characters outsmarting and one upping each other in many different ways. And then I'm going to tell you the top 20, the top 20 seconds of the entire series for me is in this episode. Oh, okay. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing that. I'm also going to give this an A plus because of the sucker punch I felt at the end and if anything can make me feel that kind of emotion and desperately want to have a Adam Sandler's remote control to fast forward through time oh, to, yeah. wa to watch next week, this would be the one. It was uh, a jaw dropper with some fun moments. Kind of hard to match the the emotional limits of last week. And I I think I still think last week's was was a little more powerful actually. But you can't beat the ending of this. Let's go ahead and jump in and start at the beginning. We start off with a uh, a quick Admiral Rampart, Vice Admiral Rampart is there talking with the Kaminoans. Uh, Tom, before we actually meet uh, Clone Force 99, do you want to say anything about the introduction sequence? Um, sure. I, you know, I, I think it, it made it, well, first of all, brought Crosshair back immediately. Um, which I've just been waiting for that. Last week I said the, his absence continues to increase the tension of what is going on, and you know bad things are going on. 
Um, we're not talking about the Bad Batch here. We're talking about one of the Bad Batch, and that is Crosshair. And he comes in. He uh, he um, makes the note that they they've been found, and uh, Rampart says terminate them. Um, the, I forget the Kaminoans' leader's uh, name. Um, uh, anyway, he tries to negotiate and say, "Hey, these are these would be more valuable to capture." Don't want to mess with it. Terminate them. Crosshair walks out. Great, great intro. I, I would say the intro for me, I, I love the old school approach to storytelling. Very Edgar Allan Poe. You've got a dark and stormy night. You've got thunder. You've got lightning. You've got waves violently crashing on Camino. It just, to me, I just sort of opened up the book to say, oh, by the way, what you're about to see is really dark really <laughs> convoluted, really complicated. Uh, things are going to go very, very poorly. And I feel like it was just, it was telegraphed to us, but I, but I was very excited about that particular vibe mm -hmm. that it gave us. But then rapidly we, we jumped down to Braca. Uh, Clone Force 99 is there. And Jay, we have a, a very interesting kind of first sequence where Wrecker and Omega are, are having a, a training session. What, what do you, what do, you, what do you make of that training session? What do you want to say about that one? Well, first of all, I am so happy that they're on Bracca because I'm a huge Jedi Fallen Order fan. I just want to put that out there. So when they got their last episode, I was just, I was so elated. So I'm kind of really excited to see if there's going to be some tendrils of things that might pop up from that story. But I just thought that this is really putting Omega out there as a member of the team in that they're really teaching her and it's not just oh this is a kid that's along for the ride that she's kind of earning her keep in all of these things she's learned how to work weapons she's learned how to do comm she's learned how to do tech and now she's learning how to disable bombs which of course it was a smoke bomb but and i just thought that wrecker was hilarious he's like oh you think i'd really give you a real one but then he says Oh, it's okay. I did. I I failed on my first time, anyways. And it kind of makes me wonder if that's how the side of his face got blown up. But oh, <laughs> I thought that too. I would hope not. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. <laughs> but again, this is just so great because it just goes to show that they're taking her seriously as part of the team. And you know, Dennis and I had talked about this on the last episode on Podcast Artist. How she's actually as old as they are, realistically speaking, if she's an unaltered clone. So that blows my mind right there to think about, too, every time they put her in these situations. That's interesting. Well, so I do want to really quickly before we move on, you're both educators. I'm an educator. How do we feel about uh, Wrecker's uh, pedagogical style of tricking her into thinking her life is in jeopardy? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, what I noted was, you know, we've been watching, um, you know, she follows the lead of Hunter echo, as I've mentioned before on this show, uh, has taken sort of the uncle, uh, approach and has been training her. And then here we get a third style of learning. Um, and I, you know, I thought it fit really well, personally, I thought it fit really well with their relationship. They kind of have fun together. They get popcorn together. They get, you know, they fist bump mm -hmm. when things go well. So here he's just, he's, he's teaching her, but he's doing it in a way that really fits their relationship, which is more jovial, fun. Although I have to say when she cuts that second yellow cord and he's like, no, 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 not that one. I mean, he really put it on heavy there <laughs> and he's like, run. That was great. It, it's, it's like the, you know, you push the kid in the pool and they learn how to swim. That kind of a thing. <laughs> that yes. is literally how I learned. My my older brother did that to me at a pond, and he threw me into the deep end and said, sink or swim, Jay. Literally. So I, I can relate to that style of learning. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thankful that you learned to swim. I'm glad, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was not as, as nice of a big brother as Wrecker is to Omega, trust me. But <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, in in a pond far, far away. Yes, yes. Indeed. yes, my goodness. So yeah, that was an interesting uh, approach between the two, and their their dynamic continues. Uh, but then, as as we as we're walking, suddenly we we shift into these guys are elite soldiers, top of the top of the best. And I thought it was it was very well communicated because you you know as they're walking here, we've got eyes on us. So there's at least three. 
I love that they can know that without actually physically looking and seeing that. It's just kind of a classic military thing. But then we've got a fun little pursuit with the scrappers. It's not a very long sequence, Tom. But is, is there anything that stands out about that, or do you just want to move on from there? Because I, mean, I could probably say a couple of things, but I don't know. I want, I want to see what stood out for you. I don't know. I mean, I think it was necessary uh, to show that they're, you know, to show their awareness. Um, but no, I, I don't really have a whole bunch to say. My only note on that was exactly what you said, that they're very uh, sharp as soldiers and aware of their surroundings. I, I really like, first of all, I love the look of the scrappers. I love I love how it's almost like um, an ancient Sith helmet or it looks like a Kylo Ren type of helmet, oh, which sure. it's not, but it, there's certainly some inspirational design aesthetics there behind the scenes. But I like, Jay, the fact that when they stop these guys, they use stun. That's mm-hmm. pretty rare in Star mm-hmm. Wars to see stun used for, for that sort of thing. I mean, the Bad Batch are soldiers, but they're not murderers. But the, but they choose to stun these guys. And I thought that was an interesting approach. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up, actually, because I hadn't thought about it that way. But I suppose it's just from the fact that maybe they're just thinking that they're locals trying to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. And they don't have really a nefarious purpose other than just self-preservation so it's you know kind of beyond them ethically to pull the trigger in any other way right well you mentioned ethics there's there's a conversation that happens uh where echo and hunter and they're i believe it's echo and hunter they are debating yep. you know clearing their debt with sid are we soldiers are we armed smugglers i feel like that was an important thing we we, we get these quick conversations with Echo, and it always centers around Echo, and I'm not really necessarily sure why that might be, but but I think it's cool or fascinating that they have sort of a debate, or again, what is their purpose? Tom mentioned that earlier, but Jay, what did you make of that conversation? Well, this takes me back to, to the last episode when Hunter and Rex are standing there talking about what's next, you know, and, and what path they're each going to be taking from here on out. And they're still trying to make their way in a world and in a galaxy where they they honestly don't know their place. And these decisions that they're making, you know, paying off Sid and then hopefully scrapping enough ammunition and things to maybe hopefully have her owe them, he says at one point. And it's all very, very new to them. And I, I don't think they really know which way to go. I think at this point, their main objective is to keep Omega safe and to you know find out what's going on with her and who's trying to hunt her down. And I just think that there's a lot that they they have questions about and there's no answers for them right now. And that's a that's a horrible way to feel. It is. It's It's like we are along for the ride with them trying to figure out how are we supposed to feel about these guys if they don't even know where they're supposed to go or what they're supposed to do? And why, why are they so hesitant to, to go after Rex? What, what is it with Hunter and Hunter probably feels like he just needs to keep her safe. But I'm, I'm Tom, I'm interested in the fact that Ek, or that echo keeps saying we're soldiers like, so, okay. So what does a soldier yeah. do? What, what is he, what is he trying to say? Well, I, yeah, I, I found that conversation to be really important or, or notable because Echo seems to still have loyalty to Rex. You know, we wouldn't have to pace it off if we would have gone with Rex. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, it does make me wonder if, you know, Hunter still has a sense of like regs versus them um, sort of feel, or that's their mission. We should have our own mission. You know, they've never played well, at least to our knowledge with, you know, the other clones. And so maybe there's still a little bit of separation, but yeah, Hunt, or I'm sorry, Echo, Echo's always talking about soldier, the soldier, even though he's a changed, uh, person for, after being, you know, hooked up to machines and, and used for military, uh, secrets and, and, uh, uh, strategy but uh but he does always go back to that and i don't know i guess i i I guess what i don't understand is why is hunter so resistant to that at this point and i and i keep going back to has omega changed hunter but he's he just doesn't know it yet well like Mm -hmm. i said i think it's just that he he feels like the best way to keep her safe is to keep her out of conflict 
And if he goes, his, <laughs> if he goes, and he, <laughs> yeah, they, it's not exactly going well. No, <laughs> but but the idea is is fairly sound. I mean, if he goes with Rex, if we're going to start going against the Empire, he wants to try to avoid the Empire. But they actually say he says he's on a different path from us, referring to Rex. But then Echo says, "Hunter, we're soldiers. What else is there?" Yes, and that's that's the thing. You know, that's the question mark that I was referring to. And can we? pause for just a second and talk about what you just brought up, Tom, with Echo being always the one to be almost loaded into finding the tech and finding the strategy and that type of thing. Mm. When tech himself was talking about all of this data that's on this Venator class ship, how did you guys feel about that? Do you, This kind of brings me back to when they were just trying to find the tactical droid head. What kind of information are they downloading from this ship and what might we get to see from this? I mean, are there holos that they might be able to pull up? I mean, I, I might be jumping way ahead here, Dan, and I'm sorry, but it just, I, I thought of that when, when Tom mentioned that about echo and I wanted to make sure I said something before I forgot. Right. No, I'm glad that you did. I, I've, I've wondered that too. I feel like that's something that may pay off later. Maybe that will pay off with the, the formation of the rebellion. It's, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I I hope that it's something that they they circle back on. But you mentioned you mentioned those hollows, and then and then of course everything from the Clone Wars. Tech has, and I was excited to ask you about this, Tom. Tech has a very interesting summation of the war because Omega asks him point yeah. blank, "What was the war like? What did you make of his explanation?" Man, yeah, I I wish I'd have written down the quote exactly because it's so just uh, definition. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's so and she says, no, what do you what how oh, I wrote it? I wrote her wrote word down, but I, can, I don't know that I can find it that fast. Oh, what was the war like? But what was it like? And he's still he like he's so he's so into the um, the, the 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 dots and dashes yeah. of what the war is and what it was and his part of it. That I don't think to tech there was any emotion to the war. It was all, hence his name. It was all tech to him, and so he he has no he has no emotional connection to the war. I mean, look, they never lost anybody until Crosshair, and even 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 tech doesn't seem to be too emotionally attached to that loss. That goes back a couple episodes, where you know they give away. Tex or uh, Echo or um, I'm sorry, uh, they give away uh, Crosshair stuff, and he's like, "Well, dude, here it is," you know. And I just, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, but I, I really appreciated the childlike approach to you know the innocence of you know it takes me back to my own childhood where you know I had someone, um, our family had somebody who had fought in the Vietnam War, and I remember asking that person out of the blue and i mean the horror and shock from the the people that were in the room when i asked that i said what was the vietnam war like and i mean just the air i i took the whole air out of the room and so when she asks that of tech i had sort of that same like flashback emotion to it but his so tactical answer to it but then her diving back in and like digging a little deeper i was like oh maybe she shouldn't be doing this i don't know that i yeah, I thought that was a really uh, cool. And then, of course, there was the distraction of the red flashing light and so forth from there. But, um, but yeah, I thought that was a really cool moment for uh, Omega. It's it's another human moment where you, mm-hmm. the childlike innocence. She again, she's such an enigma because she has the childlike innocence, but the wherewithal to be able to survive in a very very harsh environment. And I mean, obviously, she's couldn't be a better protector or cared for when she's with Clone Force ninety nine. But I just think it's an interesting just juxtaposition of uh, she's not the typical child, the child yeah. uh, character in the story. Because otherwise, Tom probably wouldn't have even watched after the first episode anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would have, but yeah, not yeah. with the same. He, not with yeah. the same. It, you have to listen to CWK pour over for more uh, more on that joke. <laughs> All right, so the Empire shows up. We haven't seen Crosshair for a while, Jay. But I I tell you what, we've been conditioned to see that when Crosshair is here, it's bad news. He's with the Empire. We know what the Empire is about and what they can do. But there's this one image 
where Crosshair is standing there and there's these rows of storm of stormtroopers or clone troopers lined up and you've got the the starships behind him and there's a bright light behind it. It's just a beautiful cinematic entrance that that was like it's like poster worthy. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. And it's both beautiful and chilling at the same time because he's the only one without a helmet on at that point. And he's striding through there, as you said, with the lights behind him and almost like the fog machine kind of thing, you know, as as the the rock star comes out on stage with his toothpick. And he and Cad Bane, I think, are going to be have to uh, share the toothpicks for the galaxy here. But (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they both have the corner on the market there. But I tell you what, he his entrance and the way that he talked really hit home that he was all in on those modifications for his inhibitor chip. There was no going back. You know, I think back to when he first got his new troopers and they were in their old barracks and he was kind of sitting down and kind of reminiscing a little bit you could tell that maybe there was still a little bit of that crosshair in there Pause, from yeah. this point on yeah there no it, it, he was he was gone and that that's that's also so sad it is it is and it, there's definitely no turning back until he has some major surgery of some kind but i i skipped over the part where we we discover the proton torpedoes and i just want to bring <laughs> it up just because i love hearing the word proton torpedoes because that makes me think of luke skywalker and Yavin in the the attack on the first Death Star would it's kind of a nice little thing. Tom, I like when they they do these sort of things. I wouldn't call it an Easter egg per se, but it certainly is a nice wink to the audience. Where I I love that because they're not batting you over the head. It doesn't feel like an obvious original trilogy placement. It just it's in that same time period, so it makes sense to like that would happen. I I love stuff like that. I don't know how you feel, Tom. Yeah, no, I thought that was I thought that was cool as well, and I love how how like possessive, in in a fun way, uh, yeah. uh, Wrecker becomes of like he carries it around with him, and even once at one point he sets it down to do something, but then he goes back and picks it back up on his shoulder, and then he uses it to help them escape a situation. But what I found uh, what I found amusing about that, and it's, there's no throwback to it, but it's how Omega finds like the little crate. That's loaded and, and Wrecker's like, yeah, that's cool. But look at this. And he pulls it. And he's got a whole wall of stuff. I just, you know, it's it's I just so well goes along with their relationship. Like she finds something that he'll enjoy, but then he one ups her with like a huge wall of it, which I thought was cool. That's great. And, and then, you know, she wants to take it apart. And he's like, not mine. This is mine. <laughs> yeah. He's uncharacteristically um, a little more selfish about it, which is pretty fun because. Yeah. And I think that that's sort of important too, because he's 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 well rounded. I mean, you know, he's not Hamlet. So let's not get carried away. But I mean, he cares about o- Omega, but he also he's still got that that primal side of him that likes to blow things up, which is pretty great. So let's go ahead. Let's take a quick break, and we'll, when we come back, we're going to talk about the actual reunion and then a, a shocking ending. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With travel beginning to open up and Walt Disney World and Disneyland reaching full capacity, this is the time to book your Disney World vacation with MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. I use Becky Mencken and MEI's incredible services all the time, both for family and for travel for the show because of their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service. Plus, they proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. Literally, I will wake up one morning and I will get an email from MEI saying that the price went down and I will get a refund sent to my credit card right away. I don't have to do anything. They help your family enjoy everything Galaxy's Edge and the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer. Can help you plan every detail and always share invaluable tips. That's for Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or other cruise lines. It doesn't have to be Disney related. They literally can help you plan a vacation anywhere on the planet. Be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and sign up for a free no obligation quote to any of the Disney theme parks on the planet or any vacation that you have in mind. You'll have the best vacation possible and help out me and Coffee with Kenobi in the process. We're back and we're talking about 
reunion, the eighth episode in season one of Star Wars: The Bad Batch. Jay, there's a there's a there's a really quick. I don't know if it's quick. It, it certainly plays out suspensefully, but the time between the Empire landing and them actually running into Crosshair, I think, is another example of every episode of this season. There's always a great moment of suspense, and there, I felt legitimate terror knowing that Crosshair was out there. But this one felt a little bit different. It felt like the cost was a little bit higher. I don't know. Did you get that same vibe too, or what stood out to you about the build up to the actual confrontation? Well, I'm I'm telling you what, I have to go back really quickly to the Kaminoans before they even got to Braca, because Lama Su and Nala Se are talking about their contingency plan. And for this other, you know, type of these clones and for Omega, and they kind of do let the cat out of the bag that they were the ones that hired Fennec Shand at that point. Yeah. So that was even before they got to Braca. But to your point, I was terrified, honestly, because like I said earlier, there is no more real crosshair in there. It's all inhibitor chip up to this point. And just everything that they're doing to to get to the Bad Batch and to Omega is just, is he really going to do that? Is he really going to do that? And he is pulling no stops. No, definitely not. So they they get um, they get to a, a big standoff um, where they're going to they walk into this giant artillery deck and have either of you been on I tell I, I know you haven't but Jay have you ever been to Galaxy's Edge? No, it's on my bucket list and I I hope to do it one day but I have not sadly. Okay. Tears roll down face. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I bring it up is when they first go into the artillery deck, they're, they're in this massive room with these huge cannons facing out this this portal, is in essence. But it so much reminds me of the attraction Rise of the Resistance at Galaxy's Edge. When you both go, kind of put that in the back of your minds because it's very, very reminiscent of that. But there's this great standoff with Crosshair, and there's some frightening stuff that happens. There's certainly some key things that I think we need to talk about. But, Tom, the standoff of the crosshair, this, I think, definitely affirms what Jay was just talking about as far as there's no turning back with crosshair particularly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, Hunter's, you know, Hunter makes up, I guess, what's a final plea at this point. You know, stop this. You, the inhibitor chip is doing things to you and this and that. And and Omega, you know, steps up like an adult and says, it's true, you know, and, and she shares her knowledge of it. And then he, you know, gets his troopers to uh, take the perimeter. And then he says, aim, does he say aim for or shoot for? But he, he, he like, says aim for the kid. Yes. Yeah. Like a total target, like oh my gosh, he's ruthless. He knows he knows how to hurt them, you know. I mean, he knows he knows the Bad Batch. He knows that they're they're as ruthless as he is, and so the way to get to them is to get to their weakest member, which would be Omega. And so when she, when she or I'm sorry when he says that though, can I tell you my dog Kaylee goes what? I said, I said, dude, this is di- this is so different. <laughs> I was not expecting that, and so so that I mean, I thought that was I mean that what a key moment in this show in this episode, like a turning point of like uh, Jay, what you're saying, no turning back here. I did want to, if I could take just a, a brief a step step aside on this for a second. Did, I, I have to ask this question, and this seems like a good as good a point as any. Has Crosshair been put in charge with clones? Are these uh, these all seemed like clones to me? Like the conscription, the conscription, the conscription troops of the Empire are not in this group. Am I right? Well, Mason actually pointed that out to me. He said, "Dad, some of those voices sound like female, and there aren't female clones besides Omega." So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I would like to see more exploration of that. As far as I could tell, I mean, they, they've got clone armor, but a lot of them didn't sound like D. Bradley Baker. So part of me is wondering, are these stormtroopers wearing clone armor? What would be the point of that? So I'm not really sure. Hmm. I think at this point we're in a big transitional phase. You know, we're we just went from the Republic to the Empire 
And they're not going to just get rid of all of their assets right away. No. But here's here's my theory that I've shared with Dennis before, too, is that as they're phasing out these clones and they're getting these conscripted soldiers to come in, I do think that, well, maybe not after this episode, who knows, but originally I thought that maybe Crosshair would be the one to train the Death Troopers. And that yeah. was you know, one of the reasons why we started seeing their armor kind of changing directly, you know, related to him and under him. And, but I don't know. I mean, that's a really good question, but the way that this, this episode ended kind of makes me rethink that. And we'll get to that when we get to that point. Yeah, for sure. And, okay. you, and we're, we're close. Cause there's basically there's, we've got some incredible action sequences that fire, that fire up. I want to say also that the whole aim for the kid thing, yeah, that that might be a weak spot, but it's also a vulnerable spot for Crosshair. He doesn't want to hear mm-hmm. about inhibitor chips. He doesn't want to hear that he's being controlled, oh, and and it just it point. pushes that button. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I've got to, if I if that happens, then she can't say that anymore, and then we, and then I can move on from that because I I picture this as like almost like a schizophrenic thing where Crosshair is inside himself, desperately trying to get out of this prison. He's very much a prisoner in his own body, in his own psyche, yes. which is pretty frightening. Like the Metallica yes. 1 video from back in the in the late 80s. Wow. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Wow. Yeah. That is a, that's actually a really great analogy. And you're absolutely right, because you think about the way that even Wrecker apologized to Omega after yep. he went banana balls on the last episode, mm-hmm. and he was... Again, and Rex too. And that was so fresh for Rex, having just experienced that with Ahsoka. And you're right. I think that there might be that part of him that's screaming on the inside. And yeah, that's that's terrifying. This is also the first time in the eight-year history of Coffee with Kenobi that someone has used the term banana balls. So a very All exciting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I picked up on that as you well. You did. If I had a prize, <laughs> we would send it over to your house. I don't have that. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Maybe a celebration. Oh, my yes. goodness. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. So they've got this brilliant plan. While Crosshair is doing his thing, threatening them, he's clearly very agitated. There's a lot of testosterone in the air. But then they've got this great idea that the there's an ion engine core escape idea that they want to do. They're going to run there. But they're going to try to create – they're charge up these cannons – to collapse the deck, which will break, every, will bring everything. This is like not the first time that there's this massive explosion, but it actually works. And finally, Tom, we we see Crosshair vulnerable, confused, uh, dare I say, yeah. scared, or at least Ooh. overwhelmed. Uh, scared may no, not be the right term. Let's but, not crazy. Get crazy now. But he's but he's <laughs> he's like banana balls. You know what I mean? Whoa! So he <laughs> that's so good. He, but I th- I think that's important. I mean, if if he's suddenly yeah. Darth Vader, you know, I, after a while, it's just he becomes like the shark or something like that. This, this, I, it this is gets important. To the, yes, I think that's important. I, and it gets to the point of what I was saying in the intro um, where, you know, we have characters outsmarting one another. And my boy Tech, man, you know, crosshair is sharp. No pun intended, I, or maybe it is. I don't know. But he, you know, he's sharp. He's, you know, he's he's trying to keep a step ahead of him. He picks up on. He knows tech is gonna is gonna, you know, uh, um, hack into their communications. He one ups them there, and so tech then comes up with this idea. Let's get into. Well, I guess it's it's Hunter who says let's go to the um, artillery deck, but it's Crosshair or oh, gosh, it's Tech who decide who comes up with the plan of if we fire off this artillery, this, this room is weakened. We're going to drop some things. We're going to have like a distraction to get out, and so there Tech you know gets ahead of them there, um, and then. And then they get to the the uh, then their next step is to get to the engine to try to escape out of the out of one of the engines, and this is fully Tech's idea, even though Echo didn't seem to be on board or or understand that they didn't realize that they were going to actually walk out of the engine. And Tech makes it says, "What does Tech say?" He says, "Well, I thought it was abundantly clear." <laughs> yeah, he did. But then, but then once again, Crosshair anticipates it. And there he is, and he has him trapped in there. Well, then, you know, Tech comes up with another 
will place the bombs, which is based on this. I think it's Omega says something about the bombs and then t Crosshair says that won't work. But if we did this way, you know, so it's, oh, man, you know, Tech's got the idea. Crosshair counters it. Tech gets the idea. Crosshair counter. I, I just I love this back and forth. And it's kind of like who's going to be the last one to make a move on the chessboard because that's who's going to win this. And mm -hmm. then we get a, a great line. Uh, where tech is trying to explain things and records like no one cares. No one Keep cares. moving. <laughs> there, there's oh. like, there's like four or five elements of that in this episode so where there's a you, quick joke. Yeah, go I'm ahead. So, I'm so glad you said that because you know, tech's my guy. And when Hunter or when uh, Wrecker said that, it kind of like got like like it was a uh, punch in the gut. A little off putting. Yeah, it was. But it made me think that's how C3PO has always felt. This is true. And tech is, is not true. that far off. Tech is not that far off from C3PO. So it was a it, that was a great moment. And I that's where I thought I felt a throwback to the, you know, originals. And, and now you say that too. It makes me think of when I'm trying to explain the food science behind something that we're cooking in one of my foods classes and the kids are like, I just want to eat it. Just stop. That's good. I like Nobody that. Cares. Yeah. I will say I if they, if I was in a firefight, I'd much rather have tech with me than C3PO. But <laughs> yes, just a little bit. <laughs> but I know I know exactly what you're saying. So then we have uh, th this great checkoff storytelling moment where, you know, if there's a if there's a a gun shown at the beginning of the episode, by the end it needs to be fired, right? You got there's got to be a payoff, and there's a beautiful payoff. We've got you've got these charges that they that they these that they need to place around the cylinder to remove the core because they're inside. The engine core, Crosshair is more than willing to fire it up to eradicate, ob obliviate these guys. And that's how far gone he is. I mean, we don't need really any more evidence to show that Crosshair is a ruthless murderer. I mean, he, when he murdered those innocents uh, back in, I think, the second or third episode, I think it was the yeah. third episode. Yeah. You knew it was bad news. I mean, uh, these inhibitor chips are so horrible. It, I really feel like... When everyone revisits Revenge of the Sith and Order 66 happens, these kind of scenes are going to stick out for us because mm -hmm. we're seeing yet again how terrible they are. I mean, I think it's fair to say that when we first saw Revenge of the Sith, we knew Order 66 was bad. At least for me, when I watched it, I knew it was bad. I knew who these Jedi were, but I didn't really know them. We didn't have the yeah. Clone Wars. We didn't really know them. Now we do. And now we know so much more about the clones. We have very personal connections with them. But I think it was pretty shocking. I, I mean, Tech even was shocked. And as we've said, he removes the emotion from just about everything. He just kind of sticks yeah. to the facts. Uh, not in a in a cold, I don't care about you. It's more like, a, why, that doesn't occur to me, so why would it occur to you sort of a thing. But the, the explosion works great, Jay. And there's a, a very exciting action sequence. I know we want to talk about the very, very ending but before we get to that, is there anything you want to say about how they escape and what happens? Uh, besides the fact that the crosshair suddenly looks like Dengar. Okay, thank you, because I thought yeah. the same thing. Yeah. But honestly, this whole sequence with this ion engine, I thought was absolutely brilliant. Oof, it yes. was brilliant from a cinematic point of view. It was brilliant from a, a storytelling point of view. And I, And again, this is what I was talking about earlier when is he really going to do this? Yes, he is. Cause he figures he's going to either incinerate them or they're going to jump out and he's going to shoot them. One of the yep. two. Yep. And then when those, those charges go off and then it moves that ion plasma towards crosshair and you can just see it just starting to melt him. I got the chills and I just, I, I cringe and was like, Oh no, I'm not seeing this right now. And, you know, all I could think of is, as, after, as you said, he kind of looks like Dengar now. Is this going to ruin his ability to shoot? Like, his his ability to be crosshair? Hmm. And is this going to make him expendable to the Empire now? Like, throwing him aside. Like, okay, well, you have no use to us anymore because you can't do this. Because I doubt they're going to spend the chip. money. Oh, yeah. <gasps> Maybe. Hmm. Ooh, that would be a happy, happy accident Wouldn't in that way. Definitely ironic. I like that. Let's hope. Let's hope for that because that's a lot better than the alternative. No kidding. No kidding. Tom, anything you want to say about that last sequence before we move on? 
Oh, I just I just thought as that casing was falling and all those pieces were coming apart and like each one of them was trying to like maintain uh you know some sort of semblance to not get crushed. Um I thought that was magnificent. And yes, that moment when the the, the engine is blasting and it shifts its uh, trajectory because of the explosion and it goes up into crosshair you really saw him flail and i was like oh my oh yeah holy cow it was like he was completely out of control there he flailed he was human and he and you could see that he was hurt and he passes out and uh and i just yeah i thought that was a really powerful moment i all those things that you just talked about did not even cross my mind but uh but but certainly um yeah the bandage definitely i don't know how you couldn't think of dengar in that moment um <laughs> it just mm-hmm. it's just a man it's just the way he's bandaged up right. but then you also have the breathing apparatus on him at one point that brings up other images of like a saw Gerrera or you know ultimately you know a darth vader sound i mean i'm not making any implications that that but just it has that mechanical sound that i think has a has a you know a theme that goes through star wars um so yeah i thought i thought that whole sequence was wonderful because of the weight of it yes you're going to be incinerated or you can get picked off one by one by your buddy what's worse well tech has the solution of course of course he does the I, the only i want to say is that there <laughs> well there are two big things i want to say with this one the suspense was insane Yes. And like yeah. holding your breath, you know, holding your breath while you're watching because you're not sure what's going to happen. The cost apparently has never been higher so far, at least in my opinion. So there's that. But and I rank this really, really high on Facebook Live this week. But I think the sound effects mix and the uh, the the sound mm. effects editing for this episode is the best of the entire series. And that's saying a lot. But David W. Collins and ILM really brought their A games to another stratosphere with this. The the sound of the charges, the sound of the explosions, the guns, oh, yeah. the footsteps, the the crashes, everything was just an absolute masterpiece in in sound effects editing. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. But, Agreed. But speaking of brilliant, we we shifted and now there's some been there's some PR folks at Lucasfilm who certainly alluded to this on Thursday night on Twitter. But suddenly we shift to this, the massive hangar and Jay, you, you, I know you're uh, excited to talk about this. I certainly am as well, but go ahead and break down for us. Uh, Stop right before the actual uh, confrontation itself, as far as the blasters are concerned, but talk about the setup and the buildup to meeting a, a I, I guess a beloved or an infamous bounty hunter oh my goodness yeah beloved and infamous I think is both very good words to explain that well once they gather up crosshair and they're trying to get back to the hangar um, I think they said she said someone's here it's the scrappers guild that and then they say this this was too much work for them or something like that and then you hear wasn't much work and you get that pan from the feet up to the head and you see that hat just tipping down and then you just hear Hunter Omega get behind me. Mm. Oh my goodness. I, I think I, I probably threw the pillow at the television screen. I was like, shut the front door. (laughs) This did not just happen. So excited. I Cad Bane is, since I first saw him at the the final episode in season one of Star Wars: The Clone Wars, he's always he's my favorite bounty hunter. I just think he's fascinating. We didn't really know what happened to him after the Clone Wars. I always wanted to find out. I was hoping we would get to revisit him. But you hear Corey Burton's voice. Mm-hmm. You see mm-hmm. the pan up from um, or they just kind of top to bottom. I believe they started the boots and worked their way up. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you've got that guitar, that old Western guitar feel. <laughs> I mean, the, the Sergio Leone stuff in The Mandalorian is obviously there, but but this is very much a down to the hat and the toothpick that we've already talked about. But then something interesting happened. He's making these threats, and Hunter's there. Hunter has been very well established that Hunter is uh, supreme when it comes to combat, but I, I suddenly felt worried that Hunter was not going to be up to the task, which is saying a lot because Hunter is Hunter. But it's Cad Bane. 
And I had this incredible shift, Tom, in my brain where I thought, I suddenly don't like Cad Bane anymore because something bad is going to happen. And so now I was cha- officially, I wrote into the Bounty Hunters Guild and told them that I want Din Djarin to be listed as my favorite bounty hunter now because I was so upset by what happened. <laughs> but how do you feel about seeing Cad Bane back? Oh, man, it was frightening. It was scary. And because I think he's a very scary bounty hunter. It's so good. Um, when when the incident that we haven't talked about yet happens, Kaylee said, he can't do that. <laughs> she goes, that was Hunter. And I said, Kaylee, don't forget, he captured Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme That's all right. in the same room. That's right. I said, he is dangerous. Yeah. And, and like, I got goosebumps when I thought of that that moment and all the other awful things that that he did in the Clone Wars. But uh, but but yes, that was that was great. And my favorite line of or my favorite uh, dialogue back and forth was. um, uh, How is it put? Um, Something along the way line of. You know, I've taken down many clones, mm, and mm-hmm. once you figure it out, one, the rest is not easy. And yeah. and Hunter says, hard, yeah. "You're in for a surprise." In Cad Bane, I doubt that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh my gosh! So and cool. just a note on costume: Is Cad Bane's hat not as wide as it was in the Clone Wars? It seems smaller to me. The design okay. of it is, I thought yeah. so too, and I wondered if there was purpose behind that, but I don't, I don't, I don't know well enough. Yeah. Well, wasn't he in a Republic prison for a while? Maybe his hat got sent to the dry cleaners, and it just never came back the same. It could be. Who knows? But... The, the air on Duros maybe changes the molecular yes. structure. But yeah. you know what's crazy is thinking back to the Clone Wars too, Tom, as you were talking, is that he was also involved with that whole arc of trying to find the force sensitive children like he was the one that was originally hired by palpatine to do that and to find that holocron and the crystal and everything like that which is insane because now they're back on braca which is part of the jedi fallen order storyline too even though they're not related Mm -hmm. but and then now here he is kidnapping omega another child Yeah, that that's why oh. I, I was ready to change my my vote because as much as I love Cad Bane and, and just been he's always been fascinating and captivating to me, he took Omega. I mean this this is a cliffhanger, mm-hmm. right? We we have to find her. Uh I think I mean I think it rips your heart out. I don't really know what else much there is to say about it. And of course you're certainly both welcome to weigh in. But when that happened, uh, as we've as we've said, Cad Bane is such a, a fierce combatant and competitor that I'm legitimately worried about what's going to happen to her. Like I, she, he's not going to fail. I mean, he's Cad Bane for crying out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about the fact that when Hunter comes to, cause Hunter gets shot, they have a, they have their little confrontation. He outduels Hunter, which is shocking in and of itself, kind of, but because it's Cad Bane, it's not that surprising. But when Hunter, does start to come to we get a, a very much a shift jay in the in how we as a viewer see the action we see it through hunter's helmet yes through his first yes. person point of view and we did that a little bit in rebels when we first saw that we had a double agent you know working with the empire and why is his name escaping me callus uh, yeah callus so that mm-hmm. we saw it with callus Hot callus. Remember the, hot, the hashtag hot callus? Oh, I remember <laughs> hot callus. Uh, so, but it was interesting. And why do you think they, they did that? What what are we trying to do with that? Because that wasn't an accident. No, I think, well, one, it gave me some serious Republic Commando video game vibes. I don't know if either one of you ever played that, but when you would get into the HUD, the HUD, you know, the heads up display, that was what you would see. And I don't know if, if Dave is trying to kind of put that feel back into that or what. But I also think that with the way that we see that through Hunter's eyes is we get to see how incredibly impactful this scene was and how they got out of there was just, it was just chilling. And can we pause for just a second and and talk about the wonderful 
showdown, that Western feel between Cad Bane and Hunter and the music and everything. I just, I had to throw that in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Because that's no, just great. absolutely amazing. But, but yes, the, the first person perspective was perfect. I just thought that was so remarkably done. Tom, do you have any theories about why why you think they chose that? I like the Republic Commando idea. I think that's pretty slick. But do you, can you think of anything else that maybe crossed your mind when you saw that? Oh, where'd he go? Tom has floored. <gasps> he was stunned by Cad Bane. My, that. I think my elbow pushed a button. Okay. Oh no, <laughs> your educated <laughs> elbow. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, you'd think my text, my favorite, my guy, and I can't, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. I, in the opening, I, I, I said that there's the, you know, the, the top 20 seconds of, uh, of, of, uh, bad batch was in this episode. Yeah. This is it. Okay. Tell us this 20 seconds was absolutely phenomenal. And, and uh, I just, here's he, my theory is the general's down. And so what better way to show the response of the soldiers than through the eyes of the general, because mm. I saw when, like when he comes to, so I, I, I had to turn on the captions. Dan, I did your trick. I turned on the captions because I couldn't tell who was saying what. And I wanted to know because I thought it was really important. And it's the soldier. We talked about echo earlier in this episode. The soldier did most of the talking in this one. And he was the most calm of, of the three of them. Echo's the one that says, um, you know, that that's Hunter, wake up, Hunter, wake up. Um, and then then you have very emotional wrecker. He's going into uh, Dan D&D &D, uh, reference here, uh, the barbarian rage. Um, when he says, what happened? Where's Omega? His first concern, of course, is Omega. Mm -hmm. Then Echo, he was shot in the chest plate. Tech, we have to get him on board. Wrecker yelling and starts firing. Where's Omega? Moving into that um, that very passionate rage, and I just don't think it has the same impact if we if we if we see it third person. I think seeing it through Hunter's eyes, he has no way of being the leader that he can be in that moment. He he climbs onto the ship and he's breathing. You can hear his breath. And it's the second time in this episode that the breath is very noted. The one earlier was crosshair with the breathing apparatus on. And he even can't tear it off, but he says, get me on that shuttle. You know, that's the last we hear from, from crosshair. Breathing through the breathing apparatus says that. Here Hunter comes up from the thing and we very clearly and distinctly, here's the audio of the episode. We hear Hunter's breathing. There's something going on here. You know, there's, there's something very symbolic to that. Because now both leaders are down. <laughs> what happens in, in battle when both leaders go down? One of them we see third person, the other one's through the third first person point of view. And I just thought it was magnificent because then we pop back to that third person point of view and it's right to um, – with uh, uh, it's uh, Wrecker and, um, and Hunter and he says he – says, uh, he took her. And Wrecker's immediate response was a crosshair. No, no, a bounty hunter. And then we have to find her. I had to go back and rewind that several times because I, I, I wanted to know whether Hunter said, says we have to or we need to. Because I think there's two different directions that, 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 that those two lines could potentially have. One of them is very soldier-like. One of them is very emotional. And it went the emotional route. We have mm -hmm. to find her. Oh, and then we've talked about the music. We've talked about the sound effects. I think this moment, right after he says, we have to find her, you get that growly low tone and you know you're going to black. And then you get that just sort of, I had the same feeling at that moment as I did in the second to last episode of, of Clone Wars season seven, mm. where there's that like just fade the black and we just are all left with that hollowness and that punch in the gut feeling it's episode eight jay you said this is halfway this is episode eight and i got that i got that punch to the gut at the end yes yeah, what like, a magnificent i loved it i loved hearing you break that down well thank you for sharing that with us it's yeah, it's the climax moment and 
the thing that I think works so beautifully about this is when you shift to that first person dynamic, first person perspective is of course, you are the character. You are everything that this, the character sees, hears, and knows, you see, hear, and know. But third person perspective is as you kind of get a little bit of everything. You know what? You can see everything that's going on. There's an omniscient narrator that knows everything. And there's a third person limited where you just have a very limited viewpoint, but you get to see everybody's perspectives. It's like you're watching them. But when they shift it to first person like this, Hunter is disoriented, Hunter is helpless. And Hunter is not aware of what's going on. And that's exactly how we are as an audience. We don't know Mm -hmm. what's going on. We're disoriented. We're confused. uh, And we are very much out of it. Because Cad Bane just showed up and took Omega, which didn't seem like that was going to happen because Omega has always been with the Bad Batch. She's always been with Clone Force 99. But giving that shift in perspective makes us feel as helpless as he does. And it's, it's a very, very intelligent way to tell a story. Oh, I agree. And you know what? And I spent like all day preparing for this and you two just did an amazing job of just making me want to cry. Honestly, this is just amazing. (laughs) I mean, it was, it was hard enough to watch it like three times, but just hearing how you both broke it down is just so profound. Well, thank you. If, if it it was because of, we said something smart, I'll take credit. And if it's, if you felt sad, I'll say that's Tom's fault. (laughs) (laughs) a little bit of both how's that (laughs) oh i i I love hearing you both talk about this it's Mm -hmm. it's it's great it's very enlightening it's it's very powerful and and i'm very grateful is there anything that either of you want to say before we wrap up uh this episode and jay let's just start with you oh my goodness it's just from start to finish an amazing, amazing episode. And there, again, there's just so many things that happen in here that I think are going to have such substantial weight going forward, obviously with everything that that we were left with here at the very end. And, oh my gosh, Cad Bane, I'm, I'm so happy he's back. And I saw somewhere that this is the first time we've actually seen him on screen since I think they said 2012 was the article that I read, which I don't know if that's correct or not, but that seems like a really, really long time to wait for this character to come back. But I'm really hoping that this opens the door for him to be in some other things, too. Like, we've got the War of the Bounty Hunters comic, and I know that there has been some confirmations of some different things, but I would love to see him show up in there, perhaps. I don't know. It's just, oh, I'm I'm floored. I'm I'm so floored by this episode, and I'm so glad that we were gifted with this. That's that's oh, wow. that's pretty hard to hard to hard to follow, but that's why I'm going to have Tom go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know I was I was about to say that I'm I'm as, I, I'm just speechless about the this concluding. Uh, Kaylee and I sat there as that as the credits rolled, and it was it was kind of the same feeling we had, and I don't want mean to shift to a different uh, franchise, but. At the end of season, this second episode of Loki, we sat there and we just stared at each other like, what? We did the exact same thing. So Disney Plus sucker punched us twice in one week where Mm. at the end of the episode, we looked at each other and we're just like, like trying to wrap our brains around all of this. But this is what I'll say. Moving forward, tech is still my tech is still my guy. But I, I am on board. I am standing right next to Wrecker. I am angry, and I want them to find oh, – like I cannot even begin to tell you how bad I want them to get Omega back. Because even though the Kaminoans – I don't know if that's how you say them. Kaminoans. Kaminoans. Even though I like to see them as the good guys here or at least a neutral party, it scares me what they – what the conting- this quote contingency plan is that involves Omega. I just don't feel like it's a good thing. I f- almost feel like it's the Empire with Grogu. It just it just kind of feels dirty. And they've got I'm with I'm I'm with Hunter and Wrecker. We've got they've got to get her back. They've got to. I I'm telling you, I can't wait to see the next episode. And I know we all feel the same way because we've grown to love Omega so much. Mason was so like, oh, because he loves Omega, too. That's she's just a great character and she's sweet. And I want I want her to get a chance to grow with her brothers because they bring out the best in each other. 
absolutely captivating. Let's go ahead and take a quick break and return to close out the show. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos and so much more if you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and i'll share them on the show you can also connect with me on twitter at mr zare m-r-z-e-h-r or on instagram at danzare c-w-k there are also a lot more ways to connect with me and coffee with kenobi on social media follow us on twitter and instagram give us a like on facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with kenobi Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash Mouse Fan Travel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word, and I can't thank you enough for your help for your support and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. We're going to wrap up this episode and I want to thank you both so very much for coming on Coffee with Kenobi and talking all about 
this episode reunion jay where let everybody know where they can find you and where they can find podcast stardust Absolutely. Well, you can find me with Dennis Keithley every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We have three episodes that come out a week. And you can hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Podcast Stardust. And I also have my own Instagram account for my cosplay. So if you want to join me over there and see what kinds of things I've got going on, I am at j.snipscosplay. And my P1 is Ahsoka, my player one, always. But I also have some other cause plans in the books, and I also have a uh, an event coming up actually in July where I will be appearing as Ahsoka. So you'll have to check that one out. So cool! And in those of you who are following Jay's Instagram account, you definitely should. She is a next level cosplayer. She is amazing. Oh my gosh! Thank oh. you so much. I appreciate that. I will second that as well. I love I love catching the updates on Instagram of you and your cosplay. Can't wait to see what you got co- brewing in the in the uh, cosplay world. That Thank sounds you. like fun. And it is. It's so it's super cool. I'm telling you, it's super cool. And Tom, where can people find you? Oh, on uh, Twitter at Draftline D R A F T L I N E. That's where I'll talk Star Wars if I'm going to be talking it. And then, oh, well, you might also see me talking Star Wars over on my blog, Seeking Positivity in the Galaxy. A big thank you to Jay and Tom for joining me to talk about Reunion, the latest episode of Star Wars The Bad Batch. Don't forget that Tuesday, June 29th at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, I will be live at Walt Disney World at Hollywood Studios, taking you around Galaxy's Edge. You can experience the sights and sounds with me. We're going to have the regular Facebook show on Monday, June 28th, and then Tuesday, June 29th, a bonus one, 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Walk with me around Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios in Orlando, Florida. Can't wait for that. Speaking of can't wait for that, on Wednesday, June 30th, remember, I've got a Coffee with Kenobi meetup from 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at Jock Lindsay's Hangar Bar at Disney Springs. Again, that's Wednesday, June 30th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard standard time at jock Lindsay's hangar bar at disney springs it's going to be a big week next week for coffee with kenobi two facebook lives a couple of bonus coffee with kenobi podcast episodes and so much more my goodness i can't wait to share the things that are coming very soon for me and coffee with kenobi have a great week and weekend everybody and remember this is the podcast you're looking for see you next time everybody This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 